In recent years, instability in the global financial markets has given prominence to an alternative financial system, Islamic finance. The Sukuk Summit 2015 is an annual event that showcases the asset class that is the Sukuk, an Islamic bond equivalent. This is showing impressive momentum in the global Sukuk market and 2012 alone saw an issuance of $138 billion of Sukuk. Leading institutions and organisations in the financial industry are attracted to this event in the capital London, which is one of the leading central hubs of global finance. I'm here at the Jumeirah Carlton Tower London, where major international players from the financial sector are gathering for the Sukuk Summit. They've come from far and wide, Malaysia, Kuwait and South Africa, to mention a few. I'll be interviewing some of the speakers to learn more about the Sukuk, but right now I'm going to catch up with event organiser Nasser Dean to get an insight into the significance of this event. In recent years, there's been a growing knowledge of Islamic finance. With that, has been a need for people to know specifics of Islamic capital market products, and Sukuk is an Islamic capital market product, and events like this provide that sort of um, knowledge. So why is this product, Sukuk, good for the market? With the lack of liquidity following the economic, economic downturn, Sukuk helps to bring liquidity for markets that are, you know, liquid. So it raises capital. It helps to raise capital. Interconnectivity between different cultures, religions is on the increase. Yes. How does that lend itself to Islamic finance? Well, it's, that's, it's, it's fantastic because Islamic finance is actually not unique product only for Muslims. It's actually it's, it's for anybody who has an ethical, ethical moral code of, of, of conduct. Because we see Islamic finance is just part of the ethical, social responsible movement, but also it adheres to Islamic principles. So, and London being one of those capitals of the world that has such a great mix of people, Islamic finance and London being one of the hubs of Islamic finance just is a natural fit. Islamic finance has to adhere to Sharia and speculation or investments in sectors deemed haram, such as gambling, alcohol, arms and port products are strictly prohibited. The Sukuk follows Islamic principles, but before we can get an insight into how, let's see how Islamic bonds compare to conventional bonds. Simply put, conventional bondholders own debt. Conversely, with Sukuk, investors have partial ownership of tangible assets relating to particular projects or special investments activity. Conventional bonds, generally speaking, abide by local legislation. However, Sukuk adhere to Islamic law. Each conventional bond represents a share of the debt. On the other hand, each Sukuk represents a share of the underlying asset. The pricing around conventional bonds is based on credit rating, but Sukuk are priced to the value of the assets backing them. Profits from bonds correspond to fixed interest or RIBA. The prohibition of RIBA under Sharia law applies to all forms of interest and not only usury. A Sukuk cannot pay interest, but of course, investors expect their capital to be repaid and a return earned. The return in this case is entitlement to a share of the profit. For conventional bonds, the performance of the underlying assets of bonds doesn't affect investor reward. However, Sukuk holders are impacted by costs of the underlying asset. Lower costs may mean higher investor profits and vice versa. The broader principle of Islamic finance is based on sharing risk as well as profit. To get an understanding of the arrival of Sukuk in modern day markets and how it works, I have joining me Gillian Wormsley. Gillian, for those unfamiliar with the term, what is Sukuk and how did the modern Sukuk 
emerge? Well, in terms of the modern usage of the term sukuk, it means essentially um, an instrument, a financial instrument that has been structured like a conventional bond, but meets all of the Sharia compliance screening uh, criteria in terms of the assets that it can be invested in and uh, the avoidance of uh, interest payments. How significant is it for the investor, Muslim or non-Muslim, that sukuk are asset-based securities rather than debt instruments? Well, I think for the uh, Muslim investor, it's absolutely fundamental. It's one of the core crit criteria that absolutely have to be met. For conventional investors, I think there's a, there's a growing pool of conventional liquidity which is looking at Islamic finance and many of those investors are interested in the ethical um, aspects and you know, there's a very, very strong de um, demand for transparency and disclosure um, and sukuk instruments meet those. As with conventional bonds, sukuk has maturity dates. What happens on maturity? Well, what normally would, ha would happen is that the investor gets their money back that they've invested, and that's the same with a fixed income security. Obviously, um, when you make an investment, you are dealing on risk. Um, there is a possibility that the company might not be able to repay you, that they might default on the investment or that they might have gone bankrupt. Um, but it's actually an important part of Islamic finance that you are taking that risk. Um, because the, the, there isn't a guarantee that you'll get your original investment back. But normally, yes, you'll get your money back. Back in 2013 at the World Islamic Economic Forum, Prime Minister David Cameron announced his intention to issue a sukuk. On the 25th of June 2014, Britain became the first Western sovereign to issue a sukuk to the tune of £200 million. According to gov.uk, the book closed with 75 orders totaling around £2.3 billion. How significant was the issuance of the British Sukuk? And what kind of impact will it have on the big players on the world market? It shows, one, that the UK wants to be a hub for Islamic finance and wants to be the leading Western hub for Islamic finance. And two, it shows that a sterling Sukuk is viable. There was so much demand for it, it could have been sold uh, several times over. In fact, I talked to one British Islamic bank who said that they would have bought the lot had they had the opportunity to do so. Does that mean sort of more collaborations with uh, non-Muslim and Muslim, Muslim countries? Absolutely. I mean, it's not about rivalry. We don't want to compete with Dubai or Bahrain or Kuala Lumpur. We want to work with them. And, and having the shown that uh, Sterling, Sovereign Sterling Sukkot works, it's part of our credentials of being, of being a major player on, on, the, on the Islamic finance scene globally. Did the UK issued Sukuk deliver good value for money for the taxpayer? A lot of thought went into the Sukuk uh, process and uh, the government wanted, and one of the bottom lines was they wanted to make sure that it represented good value for the taxpayer. What can we foresee for the British Sukuk? The sovereign Sukuk was a, a, a great success and so there will be pressure on the government, especially if they want to maintain their, their, their stated policy as, as London, as a Western hub, to issue further Sukuk. Is this just about the more conventional area of finance, seeing this as another opportunity for investment or getting involved in something that's on the up? There is, certainly is an element of that, but I think there's also a desire in the community to see Islamic finance grow for its own sake. Sukuk is issued around many regions today, including more recently, legal steps taken to accommodate Sukuk issues by European governments. Some of the motivations behind this being the possibility to attract funds from the GCC countries to finance sovereign and corporate debt. However, how are these developments affecting Muslim-majority countries with established Islamic economies such as Malaysia? Uh, for the uh, Islamic finance industry to grow, uh, you need uh, the, it to grow beyond just the Muslim countries and, and initiatives like that of the UK and several other countries, uh, non-Muslim countries, are indeed uh, extremely critical to, to show that uh, Islamic finance cuts across uh, you know, uh, the entire uh, finance community and is not confined to only Muslim countries. The past decade witnessed an unprecedented expansion globally in Islamic finance, including a notable widening of operations of Islamic banks and extensive issuance of sukuk. But how are things faring at home for Islamic institutions? So you're one of only five Islamic banks in the UK. What's that like and what's your experience been? Uh, the good thing about being part of a niche market is that there's always the upside of growth. And uh, 
testament to that. Uh, Bank of London Middle East has been growing year on year uh, since its uh, inception in 2007. Uh, we now boast a balance sheet of around £1.4 billion, which means uh, there is appetite in the UK for our form of financing and the way we offer it to our clients and customers. So you've been well received in the UK? Yes, we have been well received because uh, during the financial crisis, we were uh, amongst uh, banks that were able to finance and fund the mid-market in the UK. And now we're proud to be uh, amongst the challenger banks in the UK. Have you experienced any challenges in the years that you've been operating in the UK? The first challenge was the uh, comparability and uh, the level playing field that uh, we wanted to exist for Islamic finance uh, in the UK. Progressively, uh, as we've had more products uh, into the market, uh, the legislation has caught up with that and allows us to now offer uh, these forms of financing without uh, difficulty. The London Stock Exchange is one of the oldest stock exchanges in the world and it sits at the heart of the world's financial community as it offers international business and investors unrivaled access to Europe's capital markets. Furthermore, it allows companies to raise money, increase their profile and obtain a market valuation. For these reasons, it's a desirable prospect for companies around the world. We have a number of Sukuk uh, bonds listed on the London Stock Exchange. London has always been an important international centre for finance. Um, the London market offers access to a deep pool of institutional professional um, liquidity. London is well placed in terms of its time zone internationally for uh, continuous trading. There is a whole community of um, Sharia um, experts with legal advisors with specific um, expertise in structuring Islamic financial transactions. Now, many Muslim-majority countries around the world have very established Islamic finance industries. Let's see who the leaders are in this sector. According to Thomson Reuters' State of the Global Islamic Economy 2014-2015 report, the top five countries with the best developed Islamic economy for Islamic finance are Saudi Arabia, Oman, United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, and at the number one position, Malaysia. I understand that 60% of Sukuk was issued in Malaysia. How are you maintaining this momentum? The uh, efforts to grow the Islamic uh, financial services industry in Malaysia is a national agenda. So, so the efforts have continued uh, uh, from Central Bank, from Securities Commission, from the market and the industry. We, we are looking at uh, more Sukuk issuances, uh, more foreign currency issuances, the licensing of more international fund manage managers uh, in Kuala Lumpur. Sukuk has to be made competitive and this is where government incentives and all that are important. Islamic finance is in its early development. It's right. still got a lot of catching up to do with the mainstream. Right. What are some of the growth factors, uh, especially for Sukuk? In Malaysia, uh, relatively, I think the is Islamic finance has had a longer history uh, than most countries. Uh, we started uh, with uh, the institutions uh, like Tabung Haji, we started with Islamic banks. These are all important institutions that mobilize the funds for investments uh, in the Islamic market. So uh, this has been a pillar of growth. Islamic financial instruments were pioneered in the Far East and the Gulf Cooperation Council countries. So this part of the world first experienced the challenges and issues around establishing Islamic finance. Having overcome many hurdles, what challenges still remain for this sector? Uh, we need to uh, ensure that the, the demand for Islamic finance professionals are met and uh, numerous efforts are being pursued in this regard because uh, without talent, you, the industry cannot grow. There's always a difference in interpretation on, on certain standards in, 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 in the Islamic uh, finance world and uh, there's recently been a, a sovereign Sukuk which is, has um, been classed as Sukuk light and there's a lot of, lot of questions around. It's a developmental issue. The fact that Sukuk today does not have the same degree of standardization as uh, conventional securitization. Um, I personally, even as a non-Muslim, wouldn't want to see too much uh, 
of, uh, of um, a move away from, from standards, which is the, the strength of Islamic finance and the strength of Sukkot. Islamic products, services and institutions are lauded as being ethical and promoting an open form of relationship with the customer. However, they are not immune from issues that impact conventional finance, such as transparency and compliance. The interpretation of Islamic jurisprudence can result in different outcomes because of various Sharia um, scholars interpreting a product or service. Um, how can this be standardized? A lot of standardization already exists. Um, then the final issue really is that uh, it's up to jurisdictions, it's up to consumers to decide uh, what they're comfortable with. But within Islam itself, the, uh, the fundamental principle of recognizing diversity is there. So for example, at the IFSB, our Sharia Advisory Board, which uh, we, uh, we rely on the Sharia Advisory Board of um, the Islamic Development Bank, that has scholars from the from five jurisdictions, uh, or rather five uh, schools of thought, the four orthodox Sunni schools of thought as well as uh, the Iranian ones. So we try through this procedure to arrive at a set of guiding principles that are common across the various schools. Now, in terms of non-Muslim investors, yeah. a lot of Islamic finance products and services purport to be ethical and so on. So in terms of that, is there any guidelines along that? The principles of non-interest, uh, avoidance of haram, avoidance of uncertainty have all been there. What we are now seeing is a very interesting further development, which is bringing together the global community of savers and investors who are interested in ethical finance, frankly, this new issue of climate change. Uh, and what we are finding now is um, a move from this, this first cut, if you like, of Sharia compliance to a second cut in which you look at the impact of the investment. The Muslim community is becoming more sensitive, but also there's actually a lack of financing instruments for the wider global uh, ethically interested set of investors and so they are looking to to sukuk of this type uh, as well. Because Islamic finance is a growing sector, it's emerging, it's evolving, there seems to be a little bit of concern, a little bit of skepticism around uh, transparency and compliance. What, what are your thoughts on this? The fact that Islamic finance has distinct aspects to it, you know, it avoids certain kinds of risk, it's, it generally tries to be less imprudent, it tries to advocate higher ethical conduct. Those are all good, but you still need all of the legal and regulatory infrastructure that uh, leads to uh, the disclosure of information, identification of risks uh, that are specific to Islamic finance. So I'm, I'm with anyone who says that we need stronger regulation of Islamic finance. According to Islamic law, trading debt is regarded as immoral as the debtor or defaulter is not consulted about whom can buy their debt. Also, new buyers may impose more challenging terms on the debtor with the possibility of the debtor's assets being seized. Of course, default can happen across the board, but to understand better the repercussions, I'm going to head to the networking room to catch up with Adam Ibrahim, CEO of Oasis Group Holdings, South Africa. So there's the form versus the substance debate regarding Sukuk, and it often pertains to whether the Sukuk is asset-backed or asset-based. Can you enlighten us with what the differences are? Where we're standing today, I think people are focused on the substance. And anybody who deviates and kind of creates um, alternatives that are not compliant or kind of dilutes the Sharia compliance, one, the Sharia boards will not accept it. And secondly, importantly, the investors who I represent would not buy it. The market is discerning. And so I actually don't think we have to worry about the form over the substance. Default is not uncommon in any type of finance. But with regards to Sukuk, what are the implications? Where the risk of default comes in, if the quality of the asset is very poor, if you think about the financial crisis, we actually had no major Sukuk's defaulting when many, many, many conventional bonds defaulted. And that's really, Sukuks are very low risk in relation to conventional, but it doesn't stop default from happening. So say you have a default on an, uh, a Sukuk, how is that managed? The Sukuk, if it's a five year Sukuk, we're holding it for five years or 10 years. We actually have to price it every day. So if there's a default process, 
the price will come down over an extended period of time. So you're unlikely just to see a, a drop. So it will come down over an extended period of time. And that's if you operate in highly, high quality regulation. For 26, 25, 26 years, I haven't come across a situation where there's one has had to focus on default because you've got so much uh, tools available to ensure that you limit um, the probability of buying instruments that are for default. So we've got organizations like the IFSB, IOFI, setting standards, and those standards are so well developed and globally institutionalized. As with all investments of a monetary nature, there is the possibility of reward, but also the element of risk, as demonstrated by the collapse of the US subprime market. Islamic finance is not exempt from danger. However, some of the risks differ from those impacting conventional financial institutions. There's numerous risks around Sharia compliance, the most obvious being non-Sharia compliance. But can you highlight some of the others very specifically related to Sukuk? Cash flow is one of the risks to the Sukuk investor. If the cash flow is not generated as schedule, then they will upset the payment of coupon on time. The second um, risk of Sukuk, if it is based on asset, the market value of the asset, because you know the, as the asset can be uh, can go up, can depreciate, can depreciate. So there's some element of risk mitigation should be put in place to protect the interests of the school holders. In the case of uh, default, then the school holders have to take the asset and they have to sell to the market. And that is the market risk. So in order to avoid that from happening, there are some uh, risk management tool to protect the school investor. And what about the risks around Sukuk, how they managed uh, in terms of reward? Well, uh, Suku is capital market product, uh, it's not a banking product. So the risk, the reward, the cash flow has been uh, properly disclosed in the prospectus. So Suku investor would know who is the issuer, what kind of project we are talking about, what would be the existing debt of the company, the equity to the company, and what is the expected profit from this project where Suku is being invested into, like power plant, water treatment. So everything is being uh, calculated. And in many cases, Suku has been backed by contractual, fixed contractual contract with a third party. So there's a payment coming to the, uh, to the project and subsequently to the Suku investor. However, in some market condition, Let's say the demand of the electricity fall down, the water is not performing well, so there will be some market risk. And this is common to Islamic suku and conventional bonds. After the economic crisis, Islamic finance has made significant growth, but it still has a long way to go. Are there any new developments on the suku globally and what can we expect for the future? Sukuk will be the darling of the industry because Sukuk is a fixed income instrument, easy to understand, and the risk is mitigated compared to equity product. I think it will grow and grow further uh, with uh, structures that are uh, linked to, for example, socially responsible investments, with structures that are more uh, based on risk sharing rather than risk transfer. There are a few problems in some areas, but overall I think the, uh, the future for Skook is, is very good and that, uh, that business um, are very keen to see it grow. In terms of the development of the market, increasingly secondary market liquidity and electronic transparency would be an important and welcome development. The future of Islamic finance is phenomenal. The future of Sukuk's and income products are phenomenal because you have all the channels of distribution uh, coming through and we think if the past was fantastic, the future is fantastic multiplied by 20. The number of Islamic financial institutions and banks grew from just a few in the mid 70s to several hundred now operating in more than 50 countries across the world. The current total Islamic finance market is valued at around $1.6 billion and the Sukuk has emerged as one of the more important components of this system. As the Sharia compliant business continues to expand, no doubt the importance of Sukuk will continue to proliferate too. The future appeal of Islamic finance, it seems, is unravelling as universal.